Now it's time to start the acrylic painting for the Misty Light DVD. And I'm taking my acrylics out of their wrapping. They were in a one gallon plastic bag. And I take them out of that. And then I rearrange them on my palette similar to the way I had my oils. The cool box is here, the warm box is here. And I'm going to push that away because I probably won't use very much of it. So my uh, acrylic methods are not the subject of this video. If you're interested in how I actually work the whys of what you're going to see me do in this DVD, I, I highly recommend that you um, purchase my Acrylic Painting Fast and Loose DVD, which is two hours of digital imagery with two paintings and lots of different methods and techniques of how to use acrylics. That DVD, however, is not focused on the color system. This one is. So here we go. I'm going to do what I always do is open up the cool box and get going with my large shapes on this acrylic painting. These are traditional acrylics, not the Goldens. I may move to the Goldens later. It's an option I leave open for myself because I really enjoy both using traditionals and the Goldens. In my climate, it's quite dry, so the tendency is for them to dry very quickly, which will be very good for this particular DVD. I'm going to be using approximately a three-quarter inch brush to lay in the large shapes for this and I'm going to stay very, very much in my cool box for about 95% of this painting. So let's get started. I'm going to make my traditional dark using burnt umber and ultramarine blue and a little green and a little bit of alizarin. The colors are exactly the same. They're just uh, in acrylics now, which is the beauty of this system. And as I build in my darks on my canvas, these dark shapes will be embellished the way acrylics beautifully handle. I might just go ahead and not mix very much and make some lovely purples with the, the ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson and have some more fun making some lovely dark purples in this area. The layers that happen with acrylics allow this under texture of, of paint to show through and if I really want to get wild and crazy, I have a bottle of rubbing alcohol and if I spray it on my paint soon enough, I can create some really interesting textures. But again, that's just something I'm doing and you're gonna look at that and say, oh, Ellen, how did you do that? And this is how I did it. I spray and I get this lovely pattern. And if I put that in a lot of different places, it creates an interesting texture. The wolves are here. Design again, coming into the uh, design of the painting. The placement of the wolves is a critical aspect of this work, golden area, intersection of thirds, creating the dynamic location of all of this. And now I'm going to have some more fun covering the canvas with just a little bit of this thin down blue. That'll be neat. Just I want to see what happens when I lay the white over top of it and have some of that poking through. It grays out a bit because of it going over that orange. Uh, first wolf is darker than the other two. Like how I draw wolves. <laughs> now there's a deep value contrast between this particular wolf, who's going to be the lightest wolf, and the other two. In my twilight scene that this, this painting is going to be, I'm going to have some light areas in the back that are going to be painted with the cool colors, but it will appear warm to the eye. So even though there's only going to be one spot where this wolf will have a little light on it, from an evening shaft of sunlight coming through that makes my focal point. Um, the background will be painted with the sunlight on the distant mountains in the, through the trees. And so the, the, the concept of the painting is to have the background show some light areas and the light coming through onto the wolf in the middle and then a little bit on the snow perhaps just to tie it all together. The illusion of warmth, the hot and warm on the side of the light wolf and on the snowpack that'll be in here. That's the goal. So let's see how we can do it. Now that I've said it this early in the video, oh man, I'm going to have to do it, aren't I? <laughs> painting is so much fun. Ah, oh, what would we do if we didn't have painting? Yeah. Look at that already. A heavy portion of the canvas has been covered. And of course, this is a snow scene, so I'm going to start laying in the big, big snow shapes for this underlayment. The colors can be beautifully uh, arranged with purples, and uh, it's just making lovely colors to cover the canvas. You know me. 
after this many DVDs. If you don't know, I cover the canvas first. Well, maybe this is the only DVD you've bought, though. Wow, if this is the only one, then wow, there's so much information. Hey, you know what? I just got an idea. You heard it here first, folks. I'm going to make a DVD of highlights. I'm going to take the best of all the DVDs and put it together. And since I already have the footage hiding on about 20 different hard drives, it'll be no problem putting that puppy together and bringing it to you. So that's what I'm going to do. How about that? Would you like that? So stay tuned. <laughs> My little painting. Can you tell? Okay, this is uh, also dirt. But you see, with some of that other stuff showing through, it's not going to be a, it, it's going to be, wow, it's going to be pretty. I drew the initial sketch up here. And I had it on a piece of paper from that sketch because the composite of wolves came from the um, the photographs that were provided by my friend. And so by having that composite, ooh, I like this. Okay, that's dark. Okay. By having that composite first, I continued to think and adjust in my drawing. The initial photographs were lousy in that putting them together, I lost a lot of the, what I was looking for um, to be conveyed in this painting. So I'm going to be reconstructing it in my head and with those sketches to make it come to life. Look how easy it is to <laughs> create snow covered water. First layer went down and I'm still working on that first layer. Some of it is kind of raw and still quite wet, even in my studio. It's um, late in the afternoon right now, and it's 96 degrees outside. So if you're watching this with a cup of hot coffee or hot chocolate because it's the dead of winter, know that when this DVD was created, it was midsummer, height of summer, and uh, we've had weather patterns way over um, the normal temperature range. As I get further back, I'm going to stay into the blues and the darker gray blues because that uh, snow in the distant trees is not going to be as pretty as this snow in the foreground. The snow in the foreground will have the highest contrast. This is just the first layer. Nothing here will probably be here later. It, uh, vestiges of it might poke through, but in layering both with oils and acrylics, we have a beautiful opportunity to create interesting variations of color and value across our entire canvas. Many people paint paintings way too quick. They tend to do them all at once, all in one pass, and then they wonder why they look flat and uninteresting. I like to create depth in my paintings, and by doing that, I do it with layers. Um, with oils, I tend to um, embellish the edges more. In acrylics, I tend to play more with layers. Notice how I'm again holding my brush like I conduct an orchestra. Uh, that way I have a, um, a better handle on on the variety of edges that are available to me with this filbert. How fun! Yippee, yippee, yippee. <laughs> okay, that's a dark. Okay, cleaning my brush for the first time, in case you hadn't noticed, and going back in, same area. I'm going to put some green in here, throw in this lovely, lovely mixture of ultramarine, um, ultramarine burnt umber, and Thalo green to create some dark dark masses back behind where my wolves are going to go. And since that underlayment is almost dry, but not quite, I'm still creating an interesting bunch of shapes with my brush. Reinforcing some of the earlier structure that I had, this dark over here, for example. It's going to be some brush. And then I'm going to have to knuckle down and paint the actual wolves. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Am I looking at any source material for this? Not right now. I've painted enough to create a memory bank in my mind, shallow though it may be, <laughs> that, uh, of, of imagery from which to work in my head. It's called head copy. The, the great illustrators of the last century um, used to do head copy before all this digital reference material became the norm. And uh, for example, 
an, an art director would say, I need a, a lady sitting down holding a glass. Uh, give me a sketch. Do it in five seconds. And if you can't sit down with your sketchbook and draw that out of your head, called head copy, you weren't worth the salary they were paying you. Those were the olden days. Now what they do is they go, hey, I need a lady sitting with a glass in her hand. They just go get a stock photograph. Done deal. Sad. I'm going to make this more interesting, so I'm going to break it up a little bit. Uh, if I don't, I'm going to end up with a design problem of too strong a line going diagonally up across my canvas. So I'm going to cut this a little deeper. Come back and fix that later. Maybe I'll even get a little wolf reflection in there. Wouldn't that be cool? See, now that's a far more interesting line than what I had before. And that's, that's in design, that's one of the things that we have to constantly keep into our mind is to create interesting lines Design, 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 because it makes this whole area far more interesting to view. This is not an interesting part of the canvas, this upper left corner, but I want it visually interesting to the viewer because if you end up looking there, you should have something to hold your eye. And the sunlight's going to be coming through on the distant mountains back there, so I'm going to be sure to make sure that that's an interesting area as well. But all of this is just trees that are going to end up being detailed out a little further down the line in this painting. But notice I'm still in the cool box and I've used dominantly only the first four on the right hand side of the cool box. A little white, haven't done the red, the yellow, the orange yet. I will later when I want to get some more details in. But right now all I'm doing is just setting the stage. You know I have to set the stage for what happens later. I also tend to paint from transparent to opaque with acrylics. Uh, which means that almost all of these layers, except for anything with white in it, is a predominantly transparent part of my composition. Now I'm just putting in a little bit of the details for the, the wolf. Notice I'm not painting the wolf, I'm using the brush to make the marks. I'll put another layer on top, but it sure reads wolf to me right now, even though I've only done that little amount. And uh, I'm looking at my source material, holding it for my view. An interesting part about it is sometimes we we screw down into the details to where we say, okay, it's a brown wolf, it's got to be painted brown. Well, with the color system, I'm using the cool colors that are in the box, and the only brown in there is burnt umber, and it's not acting like a dominant hue here. In fact, it's a gray-green, which I'll bring in blue highlights when the top, when I, when I actually do the canine in its final form. By just painting in the... Um, the structure of the, the outside of the dog, I can clean up the edges later and then get him to read right. The white wolf will be here and then this, this is a dark charcoal wolf with grizzling and this one over here I've decided is going to be kind of a yellowish but the white wolf will be your focal point. But the snow color of course is over here. So if I paint him in, he's a little lighter, only a half value step lighter, no ears yet, no time for ears. But you're already beginning to see how those beautiful grays. The color system is wonderful this way because when you stay in one box, and I may be repeating myself, forgive me if I am, when you stay in one box, you tend to make, and you only have these many colors to fool with, you tend to make beautiful, beautiful, harmonious grays. Look at that. Still that three-quarter inch brush. <laughs> Oh well, life's like that. And then I have the back end of the third one, whose color still escapes me, but maybe I'll add a little, yeah, there we go. It'll make, make him kind of a dusky, purpley color, because he's a lighter, he's a lighter color too. But this is the first time I ever touched my brush into yellow ochre. And again, the, putting that color into the basic color of the wolf makes it, um, makes him stand out, because that yellow ochre is nowhere else in the painting. Oh sure, it's a yellowish background, which makes it har harmony. But uh, by keeping the color of the wolf slightly different than the snow, you'll show up. There, I got my three wolves.
cleaning my brush for the second time only. Now I'm going to go into my lighter color, add some white, and still stay with that bluish purpley color because I want it to read right. And I'm going to thin it down a little bit with a little water because I don't want it to be too much of a contrast just yet. And I'm going to start laying in some of the lighter snow where I want it to go. See, the original snow is still there, and I have a long way to go to get up to um, a white white. I mean, a really white white is this light. You see how far away I am from white? I got a long way to go before I'll get up to that light. So every layer counts. And the under layer showing through, hey, all the better. Now I use my finger a little bit, but I do have on my hand lotion as ever, protecting myself from any kinds of uh, contact with the actual pigment. This is the bank coming up underneath that wolf that's in sunlight. First pass is looking pretty good. Now cleaning out the box. Everybody asks me what happens when you get cruddy boxes. Okay, my, my burr jumper here has done what oils or acrylics may eventually do, which is to get a skin on it, which prevents it from being really, really good. Now there isn't enough left in here to salvage any of it, so I'm going to go ahead and scoop it out and out and take it and put it on a paper towel to be disposed of later. And that leaves my box pretty well clean. I'm just doing with it with an ordinary palette knife. Uh, a, lot, a lot of different shapes of palette knives. You'll find one that you like and you'll use it. Um, but once I get the paint scraped out and wiped off somewhere else, once you get a clean box like this, then you can go ahead and refill it. You could go ahead and be a neat nick and take it out, take some cotton swabs and completely clean it out, but I find that's not really necessary. I missed my palette. It's just something I do with a spray bottle of water. That's an acrylic technique that I, I think you'd find useful. Now I'll put in some new burnt umber. And I tap the box and that takes the color and settles it down into the box. My cleanest color is always at the front of the box. I generally dip at an angle like this to get into my colors. And if I want clean color, I go down into the front of the box where the clean color always resides. When I fill the boxes, I tend to push them to the back, take that palette knife, push all of the clean color remnants to the back of the box, and then refill in the front with the new clean color. And you can just keep going and going and going like that Energizer Bunny. Now that I've got my burnt umber in back, and I'm going to pick some blue and some red again, and some uh, green, and make that lovely, rich colorized brown, green color, and use that to paint in some really dark areas that have to be there for accents. So here goes. Again, cool box, cool box, always the cool box. The vertical lines of those back trees uh, creates a nice vertical structure contrasting against the diagonals that are happening in the foreground. There's a reason for everything. Nice thing about acrylics too is I can always repaint any area of it that I need to. When in doubt, paint it out. Let's see, it's dark wolf. 
Help me. Some shade on his rear end. Amazing how it starts to develop, isn't it? I, I am totally and completely astonished sometimes at how the work had, seems to take on a life of its own. I'm just sort of along for the ride. And again, in a twilight painting like this, I'm keeping my values in the mid-range with dark accents, no light. But remember how far away we are from that white. Here's a tube of paint. Look at that, how light that is in contrast to everything that's going on in here. The values that you hold to in your work is going to determine the time of day. Everybody else is a bit player when it comes to that. And so keep that in mind when you're figuring out how to create the structure of your work. You want those values to be your strong suit. And look at how these values are starting to portray these animals. Isn't that fun? Nice textural marks and more deeper values in interesting marks. Look at this. I don't have to paint anything logical. Every mark I make will, it works because it's layered. And again, acrylics do have a tendency to create these lovely layers where the underpainting that's now dry shows through. And I mean, everything that I'm doing is layering beautiful, beautiful on top of the original painting structure. And that is, um, wow, turning out to be a nice painting. <laughs> so. This darker than the dog behind, so you see him as a slight contrast. We don't have any sunshine yet, so there we go. He's down over the hill just a little bit. Uh, the source material for this is, is, as I say, a composite from Photoshop. The placement of the three wolves, I made them slightly smaller in the painting because I didn't want them that important because all of this area is supposed to be more important as the painting develops with the with the layers of these cool colors. This entire painting, if there's any message to take away from this portion of the DVD, it's that if you're going to do a twilight scene, the entire painting is going to stay in the mid-value range, unless you want to punch up a little accent like I'm going to do later on. My mid-values here are holding the painting together. Not only is the color holding together by the selections that I'm making from the cool box on those four puppies on the right plus white. These four colors are the dominant colors in a twilight scene with white if you're doing snow. But if you're even doing a fall scene, you don't want to head over to any light colors while you lay in the establishment of that twilight light. Remember in the color system, the light itself is the, the strong part. In other words, the light that's influencing the color of things the values that are influencing the color of things. This is what makes the painting work. So now I'm just finishing up this part. I've got to get the background lights in with the yellow ochre and so I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's time, she said, but first I'm going to start out with a lower version of it because I don't want it to scream. I can always come back in later and, and fix it. And it's going to get cut over with a lot of trees and plants because I don't want it to be solid blocks of light. I can paint around some of the branches that are in my head. Again, I don't have anything to look at. I'm just painting from my mind. <laughs> so if it doesn't come out, that's the reason. <laughs> excuses, excuses. Because I come in with the first layer darker and bring it up to light slowly, then that gives me an opportunity to make changes and edit it. I wanted this light here to come down hit across the walls and have it go down this way in the design and then down this way across the water. So that's two reds, so I add a little green to it. More of this brand new bird number. Oh, which I better spray everybody. All my hot air conversations, of course. <laughs> See, now I can go right across that part with some branches and vegetation. I do not paint every leaf. Ha! Wait, you know, way too much information for your viewer. They will figure it out. Let them have some fun. So for me, it's more about uh, getting the illusion of what needs to appear there and letting the viewer fill it in. 
Since the canvas is essentially covered, I've now gotten to the point where I can back off and start adding the, the, the additional layers of the twilight light. The colors are holding because of their limit, limited nature. And I'm doing my vertical strokes on water. When you want to paint water, first pass is always the vertical strokes, and then you make the horizontal lines on top of it, and then your water will read as water when you're ready to finish it. Now, wasn't that worth the price of admission? <laughs> And acrylics do dry darker, so even though I put this layer on and it may appear a little bit lighter, yeah, it probably end up being darker later. When it dries. But the color harmony holds due to the nature of the, um, the colors being all from the same side of the palette. Can't make a mess when they all harmonize this way. <laughs> there we go. I'm back after a nice break and I've zoomed in on the wolves because now I think I'd like to pull up some more detail on them. Over here on my palette, I'll be picking up a nice little filbert. It's about uh, three eighths of an inch. And I'm going back down into my colors, as you see them here, and I'll mix up lighter versions. Again, all of the colors I'm using are strictly out of the cool box. That's the beauty of Twilight. It has a gorgeous way of being soft and harmonious, mostly driven by the fact that the colors are all in the same family. So I'm going to be over here mixing up and keeping moist and I'll just mix up a myriad of wonderful gray colors to use in this pass and now there we go get a nice blend of colors to mix up and put them on this wolf a little lighter gray Acrylics with moisture on them can stay moist for quite a long time. Defining the outline of said wolf with my <laughs> three-quarter inch brush. Oh my goodness, can I do this? Of course. He'll just start to look more real than he was a minute ago. Now, you know me, I'm not a detail person. <laughs> Details in the world are left to those who are more prone to them. Me, I'm just a painter. Now my palette has a lot of different myriads of colors on it, and that's a good thing. Because it allows me to make a lot of myriad colors on the wolves. <laughs> wolves. And so they come more vitally alive for me. Mixing up some darker tones again, just strictly, completely in my earth tones, in my cool box. Now the wolf over on the other side is kind of a dark gray, so I already have a lot of the dark colors in there, so now I'm just going to continue to embellish the sides of the, of the canine with different variations of all of the grays that I have over here. It's just gorgeous how harmonious those colors can be in the color system.
a little mist. Keeps my colors completely workable in our tremendously dry climate. It's neat to see this come together this way. I'm real pleased with it. Hope you are too, watching it. This is uh, creating dimensionality. I do a lot of dimensional painting after I lay in a flat color. The flat color being the general value of the creature or the shape that I'm working with, and then later coming in and creating the dimensionality. Now I'm cutting into the back of the other wolf to create the shape of the face of the front wolf. That's cool. Only with the beauty of acrylics being so swift in their drying time. I know, I know. Yeah, but Ellen, they dry so fast. Well, they do, but some, in some ways that's just the best darn feature about them. No warm colors yet. Illusion of warm, yeah, but no real warm colors. I hope you're able to see that now. Now I've defined them better. Yeah. By cleaning up around the edges, I end up creating the actual wolves themselves. That's what's kind of cool about this method. By doing the negative things, I end up finding the anatomy of the animal. I do this in both horse painting and in all of the DVDs. You've seen me do it by this time. I think you all ought to be real experts about painting negatively. Can I hope? <laughs> Now notice I didn't clean my brush. I went straight from the snow to the wolf. Well, that's okay because that's part of how that wolf animal blends into his environment. Now if I shift wolves, I have to shift colors. <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's the initial lay-in for the wolves. Do not be afraid of mixing, please. Find yourself mixing everything more than you think you need to because the end result will be far better for the final picture analysis. More mixing makes better color when you're using a few, few colors on your palette. The more you mix, the better the final result is in your, in your painting. That's looking pretty good. Now, I think I better stop because I have to zoom back out and show you what's happening out further in the canvas. More better. All right. Over here on my palette, I've got wolf color. And as beautiful as all those grays are, they're a little too dirty for snow. So spray bottle comes out and a paper towel comes out. And I just wipe off a section of the palette. Right back down to no paint at all. Spray bottle again. Since all of that. Now, if I was working with Golden Opens, the the um, slow drying acrylics, I could keep going and just keep going, but with the traditionals I tend to paint a little faster and I clean my palette a little more often. And I spent a few moments mixing up a mixture of the Cool Sky Trifecta plus white to create the, this area in the back and also to add a little more color to the wolf so it makes a connecting line to bring us into our composition. Now all of that took just a few minutes but I was standing in front of the camera so <laughs> I figure you wouldn't want to look at the back of my head. So let's get moving now with those large areas of snow to bring more layers up to light as we work on this puppy. This brush is a 5 8 inch filbert, one of my faves, and I move into the white, which is pretty ginky right now because I've been using it so much, but oh boy, it doesn't matter if it isn't pure white now because I'm having too much fun. I'm going to add a little medium. This is matte medium. It could be Fred medium, but this today it's matte medium. <laughs> 
and I do use it interchangeably with gloss medium. It On my final stages, I almost always use gloss, but hey, this was out. This is what gets used. The gloss medium thins down the paint and yet still gives it enough body to push it around. Now, as I add more lighter areas to the snow, you can see that underneath some of that layer from down below the darker stuff shows through and that's what I want to have happen. This isn't completely light though because I have yet a ways to go to get up to where I want that magic sun sunlit portion of my snow. So I'll keep mixing in some mm, variations of the trifecta. Again remember this is the mixture that I also used up in this area of the sky. It's still going to run towards the purple side instead of the uh, the yellow or yellow orangey side and that creates the snow that I'm looking to make for us. Another layer, a little lighter, still with my good old trifecta. And changing the nature of it as I continue to make this more interesting. Now this area in the back is another layer that's going to get covered with more layers of, of vegetation on top, but it just makes an interesting pattern going back. Spray bottle on the palette. Keeps my colors highly mixable, workable. And we continue to pull this out. But I have to have this color in there because it ties into the sky that's behind. If I leave it too purple, it won't read right. And as you all know, making it read right is what matters. Thinly applied paint goes on to the ice part here, making it seem icier. Isn't that fun? <laughs> A little more here. Yeah. My next job is to take some time and put in a lot of details. Oh, details. I hate details. But I'll start with a small section to show you how it goes, and then I'm going to detach myself from the camera and come back after a lot of it's done. And I'm going to put you in front of that brown wolf, and I'm going to work on an area that is just underneath his front feet. I'm quickly scraping out that last color mix out of the way off my palette. It's there if I need it, but I probably won't. Two brushes this time, a round and that 3 8 inch filbert. This round is a number four. I use it a lot for the nice point that it has on it. I'm going to mix up a pile. And the pile is, again, a trifecta, with, but this time with burnt umber added. The trifecta makes a nice color mix for what I'm going to do next. Now, here's a fun tool. I call it the foot, but there's a lot of them out there. They're little rubber, rubber, they have a rubbery, flexible point on them. And this one's kind of fun. You can get them in a lot of different shapes. They come in packs. I have uh, several of them. They're all very fun. And what they do is they push wet paint. They're great for making wet paint work. I'm going to take a brush full of this color, add a little light to it so it won't be quite as dark. And it's kind of a bushy, weedy color. Hmm, about the same color as the wolf. How about that? And I'm going to take this tool, go over here, and put it in here, paint it in. And while it is still wet, I'm going to push, or push it around with my little rubber footy thing. And all of a sudden what's left is bushes and branches. And I'm brushing the end of it with my finger, and it becomes the area that I wanted to have for that. I can do the same thing down a little lower, adding a little bit darker colors to it. <laughs> Uh-oh, you know all my secrets now. Paint across this area and take my little footy and smear it around. Depending upon what edge I use, I get different marks. The paint that's left, and it just looks so like vegetation. Wow, yes. Doctor it up a little bit. Tweak, 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 tweak. <laughs> tweak, tweak, smear with a finger. And I've got a, a passable batch of vegetation for you. Now I'm gonna do a lot more of this throughout this painting. 
and I'll be back in a little while. Anytime I can get a shortcut out of something, I'm real happy. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Let me zoom in just a little closer so you can see that close up. I love the uh, calligraphic marks that are in it, and I'm really pleased with the way it came out with the brushwork. One thing about brushwork is that if you're going to make brush marks, make them separate and different. In other words, do not have a lot of the same brush marks in one area. And I'm going to pan across and show you the wolves, values, changing temperature of the color in most paintings, but not in this one. In this, in this painting, all of the cools are what make it work. Yeah, even that orange right there, that's done with the trifecta. Mostly alizarin, a lot of yellow ochre, and some white, a touch of blue to keep it from screaming orange at you. So I hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> okay, back to work. Okay, now it's time to do the eyes on these puppies, and I'm using my source material, which you will see, and I'm going to go ahead and paint in areas where I know I'm not going to have sunlight on the white wolf, so that he stays quite dark, even though he's a white wolf. The other wolf needs a little transition down in here to that dark. Dang, these eyes are little. I do not have a brush small enough right now. So I'm just going to bop it in and find it later. That's how I tend to work. You know, bull in the china shop. <laughs> yeah, I don't care what the shape of the eye looks like because I can always come in later with my um, brush and make it read right. That's the beauty of all this. Wow, that's so bad. Yeah, I got a Cheshire cat here. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> yeah, there we go. He's smiling. And this one has his eyes down here. This is and a dark nose. I find by going around. So I literally find the, the parts of this guy by painting out what doesn't need to be there. And it sure is fun. <laughs> Wee! It's like painting eyelashes on hummingbirds. <laughs> I so, so want to do the details that are going to show up later, but I can't. I just can't. I have to wait until I get into my warm box. For the very first time now, I actually have opened my warm box. This means that I will be using some, maybe not all, of the colors in this box to highlight my focal point and the contrast against all of that twilight cool that's been done completely with this box. So now it's time for me to actually do some major punching up of the canvas. Doesn't matter which white, they're both clean, but since I'm mixing now out of the warm box, I better stay with that white. That's just a good, good policy. And I also want to add some more medium matte medium <laughs> to my mix to thin it down. This is going to be quite a contrast from what was up there before. And so, so I'm going to be laying in my sunlit part of the snow. And this is a lot lighter but still not anywhere near white. I will put a little bit of it over here 
just to carry the view viewer in that direction. There might be some of it here. I want it to fade out though, like the sun has gone down. So I don't want very much of it anywhere else, except as a mere suggestion. So as I mix into my medium, that totally thins it down, and I can paint on top of my cool areas with a soft edge. I don't want very much warm, but I wanted that sunlight in there to actually establish the punch. That tells me now, going and looking at this backer area, that I'm going to have to bring that up in value, but I have to use my cool colors over here, because the warm colors won't work at distance. The rules of the color system say that at distance you use cool colors. Nearby, if you're in sunlight, you use warm, otherwise you're still in the cool box. All of this is cool. All of this is cool. This is the only place I've laid any warm whatsoever. And it's a process towards finishing this. Now that's a lot lighter. Too light. So I'm going to take it down in value by adding a little bit of the trifecta, which is your uh, yellow ochre, lizard and crimson and ultramarine blue. That's a little darker. Yeah, that's what I want. But I want it lighter back there than I originally painted it. Now remember, everything dries a little darker, so that'll have an effect on the final picture as well. I think I want it a little illusionary warmer, so I add a lizard and crimson and yellow ochre back into it, keeping a little bit of white in there. No more yellow ochre. Continue to mix. There's no harm in mixing up more than you need. That's a nickel's worth of paint down here. And sometimes you have to mix an awful lot to get exactly the color you're seeking. Or in this case, the color I'm seeking. <laughs> Let's soften some of that. Yep, yeah. yeah. plan. Smaller brush. Always with acrylics, I always wet my brush first. It's just a matter of habit. Always a good idea. And that wolf. First layer of the warm. Going up to highlight this wolf's face. It's starting to come alive now, and it's because of the contrast of the warm versus all of that cool the twilight light in the evening has a hint of orange in it as wood twilight light but it's a white wool so I have to keep it pretty light yeah I think I'll put a little bit of ridge light on her back just because I think it needs to be there it's not in the photograph but again this is what we do as artists we tend to um, emphasize and accentuate what's really there so it really shows up and now I have to also put some sunlit, evening sunlit things here in order for it to read right. But the twilight in this case, my contrast in this area, and that illusion of contrast back there, this little tiny section of warm is what makes this painting start to work. You know, where do you stop? That's a question we always get asked and always end up asking ourselves, where do we end up calling, calling it quits on a painting? Well, I tend to call it quits when I can squint and I get the message about what it is that I want the viewer to see. If I have that message clearly out for the person to see, then I know I've achieved my goal. Detailing in, just putting a little warm evening sunlight on the vegetation that's coming across there so that it reads as being in the evening light. If I go back into the cool side and come up and put shadows on them, then they even read more correctly for what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm starting to really think this is getting more being finished. Uh, this wolf needs a little bit of light on him, so I'm going into Burnt Sienna and phthalo blue to create a warm dark mix and I'll add a little touch of light to it and then I'll paint the light on this guy's head so he reads more, oop, not light enough, grab some more of that white over there, maybe too light but you can see the mix and no, it's not too light, yes it is, <laughs> go back and just mix up the same mix 
taking the same two colors, don't clean your brush, just take the same color and add the same mix to it. It'll overwhelm the white that was in there. And then you can cross over light, mid-tone, darker to get any variety of value that you need with the right color. Light, but, only, but in the cool family. So again, what I've been doing in this part of the painting is bringing it up in value so that I have more interest in those areas. Do you remember what it looked like at the beginning, long ago and far away? I have new studio dogs since the uh, earlier DVDs. I now have Willow. That's her <laughs> drinking water. <laughs> And I have Sparky. Many of you have already met Sparky. He's a, uh, a Teddy Roosevelt Terrier, which looks a little like a short-legged rat terrier, but far more bone and substance. How do you like it? When in doubt, make it more interesting. Connect the dots. Don't make anything exactly the same. Use descending st structures. In other words, if you're going to put four things in a row, make all of them different and make sure there's an ascension or a dissension to them. This is just Ellenisms about how to paint more effectively with good design. But good design can be found in uh, between the covers of many books and all of them are useful. You just have to learn to translate them into design for the artist. That's probably the hardest part. I want him to have lighter legs so he shows up sort of. I don't want him to compete with the other wolves that are there, but I, and I want him to be a unique feature so he has to look a particular way. There. Now, what can I do to make this finished? Wolf eye. Wrong size brush, but what the hey. There, we got a nose now. Okay, let's do a quick review here now. Twilight is the cool box completely. Keep your values down. Watch at the end when you punch that you don't punch too much. I'm still quite a long way from white. I never ever got completely up to the white. Twilight, you want to stay down in your values off the top two. I put in some warms in here only for punch. You can get away with not doing it and all I'm doing now is dinking. <laughs> Okay, I'm using cool box colors to make those dink marks. Everybody should dink a little bit in their life. I'm no exception. I dink when I can. And I'm just having fun. And now I'm going to sign this puppy. Let's rearrange this. Fuse easel goes up. Camera goes to the right. It zooms in. Zip. Okay, I am going to sign this. The brush I use is a, any any small pointed brush. I've got a number or something round here. It's around 1500 silver white. Anyway, it's an old brush. Doesn't look too good right now, but uh, it will come to a good point when I get it wet. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Good enough. And I pick a contrasting color. In this case, I want it lighter. So I'll pick the lighter warm color I had. And now in doing my signature, all I do is make the first letter, the second letter, if I have enough paint. Then I go back and get more paint. Always leave room for that frame. There'll be a 3 8 of an inch frame. You want to keep it at least above that enough. Signature hatch mark. There. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There. Fill your brush several times. That's the key. Uh, don't try and do it all like a, pen, a ballpoint pen. That wouldn't be very effective. There she be. There's a little glare on the top from my overhead light. 
Let's zoom in and take a look at her. And I think we're done. I hope you've enjoyed watching these DVDs and have learned a lot. Please, if at any time you want to have any conversation with me, I'm always available via email mostly. That's the best way. But you can contact me through the addresses and such that are shown up here. I do hope that if you have any questions at all about what you've seen in the DVDs that you'll contact me. I can always improve what I put out for the art world and I would love to hear from you. So. Happy painting! <laughs>